So I uh, maybe maybe uh, we start in order to have lots of time for discussion. Uh, hello, everybody. I have the honor uh, to be the chair of this uh, of our next panel, which is titled actually what was its title? Memory and Labor. So as you can see, uh, we are uh, we have I, th I think we ha will have a great occasion to continue some of the discussions and of the some some of the uh, the points we have already started to discuss uh, in uh, Adam Razovitsky's uh, lecture t this morning. Um, my role will to be to introduce uh, our panels, and then I, uh, I'll really, uh, I'll be really interested in what we uh, will um, get to know from our panelists. So I'll start uh, with uh, Till Hilma, who is uh, sitting on the right, uh, on the left from your side. Uh, Till Hilma graduated from uh, University of Vienna, uh, I think, and uh, has uh, done a PhD uh, in sociology in Yale University. Now he has joined uh, the sociology department of um, uh, Bremen University. And uh, what's interesting uh, about his, um, uh, let's say, academic um, trajectory, um, this is also something I think most of us here on the panel are, are, are sharing. We, we all started, or main, m many of us, some of us, uh, started with uh, interest uh, in, in, in memory studies and also memory of Second World War, classical memory topics, and then uh, uh, get, uh, took a look and opened up for this transformation uh, uh, history. I think this is also true for uh, Joanna Wawrzyniak, uh, who is... Uh, uh, sitting uh, in the center. Uh, she is uh, the head of the Social Memory Laboratory at the Institute of Sociology at the University of Warsaw, and actually um, also graduated from the University of Warsaw. Um, and, and, and also in her case, she, she started to, to research the, the history of Second World War in, in, uh, post, uh, in, 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 in state socialist Poland. And now, um, as we have already uh, get to know before, uh, is, uh, heads a project on on uh, the social memory, let's say, of, of uh, transformation in privatized uh, uh, companies in Poland. And to my right-hand side uh, is uh, sitting Mariusz Ijastromp, a uh, historian and graduate studies graduate from the University of Warsaw. Um, He's, um, he, he also has, has maybe a, a link to, to, to memory and, and Second World War studies as he's working at the uh, Polin Museum of the History of Polish Jews. And uh, at the same time, he is, um, he is um, concentrating in an economic and social history of, of uh, post-World War II Poland, mainly also um, on the um, car and automotive industry. And uh, I'll be, uh, I'm, I'm really interested to hear uh, also from you about um, uh, about the stories of of, uh, of uh, Polish, um, maybe not only car industry factories, but also others, uh, how they actually survived transformation. So um, we'll start with Till, uh, and uh, yeah, the floor is open. Well, thank you, Florian, for this introduction, and thanks for organizing this great conference to the organizers. I'm very happy to be here and to be able to um, present a small slice of my uh, doctoral uh, fieldwork, which I did on the broader topic of transformation time experiences in East Germany and the Czech Republic. Um, and I did an interview study uh, in 2016 and 2017 with 67 respondents, focusing primarily on their narratives of, uh, of economic change, the way they perceived economic change after 1989 at work, as well as the way they perceived these changes in their social environment, specifically also in their friendship ties, which is something that I won't, be, won't have time to talk about today in detail, but maybe we can discuss it more in, in later. So for my presentation today, um, I would like to make the argument that uh, we need to study uh, the moral grammars of worth to understand transformation time experiences. And really, I'm building on what we've been discussing here in the past couple of days already. So that there's something very important about uh, this idea of, of morality in, in connected to these experiences. And uh, the, the, the specific concept that I would like to use, I'm a sociologist, as you've heard, um, is the concept of deservingness, which, uh, for instance, uh, was defi defined by philosopher Andrew Sayer um, by pointing out that um, internal goods like character qualities and social relations 
are seen as more fundamental than external goods, like money and fame. Um, then there's this, there's this sort of relationship between the two. The external goods, material goods, somehow want to be uh, perceived as deserved. So I think that's an, that's an important point about, how, about this relationship between the material and the, and the cultural side of these things. Um, but specifically deservingness, I'm, I'm referring here to this, also the social justice literature. So we can say that deservingness refers to judgments uh, about someone's responsibility for an outcome in the present by attributing uh, individual responsibility for agency in the past. Okay, that, that was kind of a complex way of putting it. So the point is, when someone makes a, a judgment of deservingness, what's happening is that agency in the past is morally evaluated. evaluated. And, and in the justice literature, we find specific, specifically two principles. The principle of merit, which is based on the idea that there is an individual responsibility, individual effort um, for outcomes in the present versus the principle of need, which points to structural conditions like luck, social ties, um, ha happenstance, physical, psychological conditions have to be taken into consideration for evaluating someone's agency. And I think why this concept of deservingness is interesting is because it's, it's actually more than just a psychological concept. Um, and one level we can, we can see this is when we look at uh, deservingness as something that people do to identify with groups. So they draw group boundaries, they identify themselves with an in-group and, and draw a boundary towards an out-group. And here I draw specifically on the work of Michel Lamont, um, who uses a Durkheimian framework to, to make a case that very often we find that economic differences are interpreted morally in this way. So economic differences are translated into moral differences through this process of, of boundary drawing in groups. And then second, there's also this concept of the moral economy, which um, maybe we can also talk about more in, in, in the discussion, uh, which, which is again another a concept that helps us to see that some of these sentiments uh, and evaluations of economic processes actually relate to larger patterns in society, larger grammars in society, so they're not just subjective like judgments, but um, they, are, they do relate to larger discourses, for instance, ideas of history. Um, and what I find interesting about this moral economy concept is there's actually a tradition w within the writings of historian E.P. Thompson, which is specifically also a memory mechanism because it is about the idea that um, the moral economy is about um, like legitimate criteria, what distinguishes legitimate from Ill illegitimate economic practices, and it relates to a consensus rooted in the past and specifically to an event in the past. And so this event in our case is the event of, of 1989. Okay, so let me just very briefly give you an overview of my data. Um, I will not spend a lot of time on this, but just to get a sense of what it is that I was interested in this, pro in this project. So like I said, um, I was interested in, in documenting people's experiences of the transformation time. It's a combination of biographical and, and focused or semi-structured questions. Uh, with 67 respondents from these two societies. I chose to talk to a generation. So my criteria was that people, I was interested in, in, in people's experiences who had finished their education before 1989. And so they were mostly between, between around 20 and 35 years old when, when 1989 happened because I wanted them to have an experience of, of that system change. And I'm also comparing two groups um, based on this idea that there, there, is, there are these different uh, social mobility outcomes um, after the transformation. And so I'm, I'm comparing engineers and care workers, which is also a gendered sample. So most of, like, almost exclusively my care workers are female. Among my engineers, uh, there are some women, um, but the majority of my engineers is also uh, male. And the reason why I, I chose this, is, uh, this comparison was also because there's, from the literature we know that Specifically, the East German and the Czech case are two cases where the value of, of skills was very important for, uh, for social mobility outcomes after 1999, more so than in other uh, post-socialist societies. Um, okay, so now I would like to give you just a very brief overview of this historical cons like, uh, background that I'm using here. And this won't, won't be the, the focus of my presentation, but I just wanna make a case why I'm, I'm studying this comparison between the GDR and, and, and um, Czechoslovakia before 1989 and then afterwards. So um, 
basically the argument is that these were very similar systems uh, before 1989. Um, and so, for instance, there's this designation by uh, political scientist Klaus Offer, who referred to b both of these regimes, socialist regimes, as based on the principle of economic integration by which uh, he means, and I quote him, the GDR and the GSR, the state socialist success stories, are integrated primarily economically. And for all the notable differences between them, in the following ways they have more in common with each other than with any of the other countries. Their industrial potential was well established and constantly expanding, owing to wide-scale pre-war industrialization, and per capita industrial output was correspondingly high. Um, in addition, the fact that they, the only two of the six countries in which a strong labor movement existed before the communists seized power also has to do with their pre-war pre history as industrialist, industrialized societies. So these were two regimes which were heavily based on this idea of social integration through work, as a, a German social historian has called it, and especially in the late socialist social contract, a model of economic benefits guaranteed in return for loyalty and a widespread depolitization of society, a kind of stalemate. Uh, after 1968, um, the, uh, the Communist Party had, of course, lost like any claim to political legitimacy, so it based their legitimacy more in, these, in, this, in the economic realm. Um, and I also want to point out some very interesting, for me, very interesting literature. Um, for instance, by, by uh, Thomas Lindenberger, who is here today, uh, which has pointed us to this, uh, to this specific late socialist conditions, again in these two regimes, um, of a social disciplinary mechanism in which, in which there was an increasingly moral definition of this idea of productive work. And we had these small moral communities that created boundaries, moral boundaries towards negative milieus and, and defined themselves as productive in their work ethics and, to, and, and towards uh, increasingly milieu-based definitions of, of people deemed as war child, parasitic, in, other ways, in, in some other ways unwilling to work. So this, is an, this seems to be an, a very important legacy also for understanding the, the economic uh, transition in not only in these two cases, but specifically in, in my case here. So what happened after 1989 in these two cases? So the argument is that they were very similar before 1989. After 1989, we have this pretty massive divergence. Um, as we know, East Germany is a case with massive unemployment, and, and the Czech Republic is actually a case with very low numbers of unemployment after the, after the revolutions. Um, but then in East Germany, we have this increase, like initial increase in wages. In the Czech Republic, wages um, stayed very low for the, during most of the transformation time, specifically also for this group that I'm looking at, care workers. Um, I also think it's important, but maybe we can talk about it later, the way the transformation time was represented in, in public discourse. So in the Czech case, we find an early version of economic nationalism. Uh, for instance, in this quote by Václav Klaus, talking about what we need above all is work, real sustained work, spiritual and industrial. And, and this masculine way of, of sort of, of selling the transformation to the Czech population is very important and stands in very stark contrast to the patronizing way in which uh, the transformation was uh, rationalized in the German context, in which it was mainly uh, narrated as a type of deficiency on behalf of East German industry, work ethic, um, and culture. Okay, so now, after giving you this uh, just historical uh, sort of overview, so what I want to do is I, I want to look at these, uh, like the way I found, I found certain beliefs about deservingness in my material, and so for this, it's important to recognize that in both of these cases, East Germany and the Czech Republic, we have uh, evidence for initially very high support for market justice, the idea of individual responsibility for economic outcomes, as documented here in the Social Justice Project, from, uh, which is a longitudinal project. Um, and so these two, according here to the authors, were there was a revolutionary zeal in both East Germany and the Czech uh, part of Czechoslovakia. People really believed in this idea of, of market justice initially. Of course, there was a disappointment later. You can see that in those trends in justice beliefs. But I still, it's, I think it's interesting to ask, so what exactly was that disappointment? So is it really a disappointment with this idea of the market in both cases? Um, and so what I'm, what I'm applying here is a specific method, um, which is, the, I, as I mentioned before, it's a method that, that tries to understand how people 
define themselves by drawing boundaries to others. It's a social boundary approach. Um, and specifically, I, I was interested in the question, what do my respondents think counts as deserved or undeserved uh, social mobility outcomes after the revolutions? And so the way I asked this question uh, is also specific. Um, so I asked them, so some, sometimes they came up with examples on, I didn't have to ask them, so some people just made these references and, and brought up other people's stories. But uh, I also specifically asked a focus question about, uh, some people think that those who did not manage to get back on their feet after 1989 economically were responsible for themselves. And so, and then, and then I asked them to provide examples from their from their real life experience, from their friends or from their acquaintances, neighbors, whoever they wanted to talk about. And it turns out that that uh, there's a very strong sense of like of of, of sort of this, the, the the way people gather material about this time is very much connected to their social experience of the time as well um and so i just want to I'm, I'm, I'm i will give you four types um of of deservingness that i'm differentiating here but I, first I want to give you this quote just to, as, a, as a kind of general sense that I came across in my material quite often, which was the sense that after 1989, and we already talked about this in, in some of the presentations, um, there's, a, there's a strong sense that people started to judge each other in terms of their, in terms of their material trajectories after the revolution. So, and there was a sense uh, among respondents that this is something new. And I'm not quite sure how to make sense of this because, because Obviously, um, if you look at this, the literature, people also judged each other morally before the revolutions, but this element of a, a certain political judgment is, is lost, and so in a way we could maybe say that uh, after the revolutions we find this intense, like the, the moral dimension is in, in, even stronger in that sense, trying to make sense of whether someone is sort of uh, on a deserved or not on a deserved uh, pathway in their own biography. So here in this example, and. and, and female respondent talking about how people suddenly felt that they could judge each other, suddenly felt that some, they knew for some reason that whether someone was, was fit or not for a certain profession or not, so. Um, okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to differentiate, like I'm going to present four different, like I, I call them accounts. Uh, the first one is an, uh, that I found is an account of deserved success, um, which commonly is an account of another person successfully overcoming various kinds of hardships typical for the transformation time. Like for instance, phases of unemployment, job insecurities, or involuntary retraining. Um, and so these stories, whenever someone tells a story like that, these are stories that, that focus on this idea of individual responsibility. Because uh, someone actually managed to, uh, to overcome uh, a hardship by means of sort of mobilizing internal, internal resources. That's the point of these stories. So for instance, here, this is an East German engineer who talks about how um, there were these close-minded people after the revolutions, and then he talks about his one acquaintance of him who, who was for a very long time not actually doing anything proper, uh, but then at some point he, he sort of had this in, illuminated moment, so this moment of realis realization that he has to take care of himself and, and, and that this worked. And, and so this also, he, as, as he told me, kind of um, made their, their, like improve their relationship. So they would afterwards say their, their contact also improved because this, person, this person's change of mind was, is like an important moral outcome of the story for him. So very often in these stories, there are, there are character attributes and individual dispositions are foregrounded, uh, like someone is specifically forward-looking, hardworking, or savvy to, to ex achieve these kinds of outcomes. Uh, a second account is uh, that I found is I call deserved failure, um, which uh, some respondents tell stories about others who, um, for instance, in this case, a former friend of mine who is too static, um, so, and this person also removed himself, as the respondent says, from his, uh, from his skilled pathway, namely as a training, as an electrician. Um, and so I find it very interesting because this is, an, this is a case where the respondent um, is very critical of, the, of, of unemployment in East Germany after the revolutions. 
but he uses this story to say that there's just a limit to his patience in that sense. So, like, so many years after the revolutions, we can't be, you can't blame it on a system. That's literally what he says. So, so you can see that, I mean, this is also a story of a broken friendship in that sense, but it's a story of someone just deciding that his patience is just over and that you cannot, and it's, I find it very interesting that um, sort of by dragging this story closer to the present, the, the, the time of, of injustice concerns the time right after the revolutions, the time of the Treuhand privatization, the time of mass unemployment, but what comes afterwards is sort of a different story for this respondent. And from the social structure literature, we know that uh, this is in fact not the way it is because we know that, um, uh, for instance, uh, those like labor market chances after the revolutions in East Germany were heavily determined by people's education and skills before the revolution, like before 1989, their education, by their age, by their gender, by the, loca by the location of their firm, even by, by factors such as the, the duration of the privatization, privatization process within a single firm. So we know that there are all of these structural features which then affect people's trajectories even decades afterwards. So it's, it's, it's a complicated um, problem to, to sort of decide single-handedly when that time of structural pressure is over and when the time of uh, individual responsibility begins. Um, and then uh, there are many accounts of undeserved success in the material, like this one where a, a Czech engineer talking about, and we've heard stories uh, like this in, in the past days, um, usually there are designations of former rats, red directors, turncoats, people who used to have some sort of political affiliation before the revolution and then are sort of understood to have profited from their former networks um, undeservingly. And this is interesting, for instance, my engineers, uh, my, I'm talking about like my, my respondents who are engineers, um, <laughs> um, uh, very often uh, draw this boundary by emphasizing their skills as something political neutral, so they're, because they're engineers and they, they have like this, this technical education, they remove themselves from any kind of political affiliation before the revolutions and also after the revolutions. Um, and so this, is, this can be heard very often about uh, certain, well, like I said, certain former politicals. Uh, and then finally, but it's, a very, it's also a very important account, so I don't wanna, like, uh, the fact that I put it last doesn't mean that it's less important. Um, these are accounts of undeserved failure, uh, which, um, which oftentimes, like, introduce, like, they, they're concerned with someone's agency, like we heard in the, in the keynote today, so this is precisely this idea of evaluating someone's agency, trying to put it into context, trying to identify certain structural factors, such as here, uh, where this respondent, an East German care worker, she argues that this person was torn out of her social context. She also changed her personality, according to this respondent. She, she turned into a materialist person. But the important point in the story is that she, was, she, she argues that she was torn out of her context and that that's, how, that's why she was not um, able to cope with those problems. Um, how much more time do you have? <laughs> okay, so that means I have a lot more time. Huh. Great. Please don't make use of it too much now. Okay, I should continue talking. To, uh, be able to finish um, in time. I okay. Hope. Okay. So well, um, so let me point out here. So the, the factors that uh, that surface in this genre are most often age, a certain generation is too old for being able to cope with those cha changes, then mental, physical impairments, the need for a stable social environment, support from others, basically elements of the sociological explanations, which, which are also part of these narratives, which can be part of the narratives about, um, about someone's um, individual responsibility. Okay, so, so now, um, I would like to somehow uh, to try to, to give you a sense of uh, what I think is, can be the, the takeaway from these comparisons or from this typology. So um, what I want to point out is first that, and we've heard this in, also in, in Veronica's talk and others, that there is a very strong sense in, in, among all of my respondents that, that to narrate one's economic trajectory after revolutions as deserved. So this is kind of a universal element of these stories in that sense. So it's, it's very, strong, very strongly morally charged. 
Um, and then very often what I, what I found also in this material and also among, and I will talk about this in a second, also about, uh, both among East German and Czech respondents is this a certain impetus to, to draw a moral boundary towards those below them who are regarded to have failed at, at the transition. Uh, which is then read as a moral failure. So an economic outcome is, is, is read as a moral failure here, in this sense. And there's, there's, this, in, there's this tendency to disassociate the self from these stories. So, uh, and this is something that came up in some of these friendship stories where people have an, an urge to, to sort of justify this break in a friendship, for instance, um, by introducing these criteria from removing oneself from someone else um, on this basis. Um, so, like I, I showed the earlier, so that the East German case is, of course, a case with massive unemployment. And so we know from the social structure literature um, that uh, unemployment is, is one type of experience that really makes people critical of individual explanations for, for economic outcomes. And so, um, so basically, this is, this is well proven that those who experience long-term unemployment in the East German transformation are also very critical of this idea of individual effort, individual um, responsibility for success or failure. Um, but I do, f uh, so, and, and gen the general picture is that the Czech respondents are more like inclined to, to, to talk like that. So they, are, they have more of a, like also like in Veronica's presentation, like this idea that there's this very strong sense of, um, uh, of a, you took matters into your own hand and you created this story for yourself. And I find this also in parts among the Czech care workers, which is quite interesting because this is a structurally disadvantaged group, but they also share the language of deservingness. Um, and then among the East Germans, of course, there's a lot of um, complicated factors here, which <coughs> also concern the relationship to West Germans. Um, but basically, so I think one of the most important patterns, and of course, this is not a representative study that I'm doing here, so this sampling is not representative, so I cannot claim to um, correct or in any way extend any of these survey, quantitative survey studies, but, but it is interesting to see that uh, also, my East German respondents, um, they share this idea of individual attributions. Like I, as I mentioned earlier, there's this distinction between unemployment right after the transition, which is kind of coded as a collective problem, but then labor market troubles closer to the present can be coded as more individual problems. Um, or um, some, some of the engineers that I talked to who have experienced unemployment themselves uh, there's a certain inclination to turn that into a, a positive lesson from the past because the narrative of pride and of overcoming uh, economic troubles is very strong in those cases. This is, I would say it's about a third of my East German engineer respondents who have experienced unemployment themselves, um, in fact, have turned it into a, a story, a badge of honor in the words of Richard Sennett, into something that they carry around to prove as a proof of their worth and not as an insight into as some sort of social structural inequality. Um, and so I think it's, 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 a, it's a good uh, idea to connect this back to this idea of, of the legacy of productive work, to these moral boundaries from late socialist times, specifically to understand this, this evaluation of unemployment in, in these societies, which is very complex morally because it was, um, of, as we know, almost insignificant before 1989 and then it suddenly like in the East German case it was like the rate of unemployment uh, jumped from essentially zero to about one million people in within one year after the transformation um, and so there's some important um, like this is an important framework for how these moral beliefs are articulated and so let, let me conclude uh, just with one remark about um, about the, the East German transformation in this sense so in a way, the argument that uh, these, these resources of, of an economic identity and this emphasis on skills is, um, is if, if, we, if you compare these two cases, the Czech and the East German case, it's quite interesting to see that uh, the, the, the Czech case is really one in which uh, there was an, an, we ha there's something like an identity offer after 1989. So that uh, Czech respondents also don't have this strong sense of devaluation as the East German respondents. And I think it's interesting to ask whether 
it, it, it's the case that specifically this, is this German way of, of, of sort of very technical way of talking about uh, the, the, the privatization and about East German backwardness in economic terms, which is a very, I think, important like narrative, like economic inefficiency, um, that this is an, this is an important um, so source for, for a feeling of devaluation. And, and the second implication from this is that we see, which is also not something new because we've heard it and during the conference, but there is a lack, there's clearly a lack of a collective narrative of these, of economic failure. And so within East German society today, we, there is a strong sense of economic failure, but there is no collective narrative. And so this is kind of what, where the far right wing party comes in to provide a narrative that also manages to remove blame and to pick up certain elements of these, um, of these um, interpretations. Okay, well, I think I'll close with that, and thanks for the attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, thank, thank you so much still for your presentation, and uh, uh, for uh, and now uh, uh, I, have, uh, I have come back to the old Leninist um, uh, wisdom of uh, uh, trust is good, but control is better, so I'd like uh, Joanna to <laughs> stick to the 20 minutes. <laughs> The floor is yours. <laughs> try 22. <laughs> well, first of all, I will try your passion, patience with another talk about industrial labor. But Adam's keynote, this panel, and this conference in general stems from our observation with Veronica that in current research on the memory of transformation, scholars but, uh, paid so far surprisingly, surprisingly little attention to labor and memory. Uh, why it is important for at least three reasons. First of all, the industrialization was the key experience of the 1990s in Eastern and Central Europe. I would say much more profound than lustration or other uh, mechanism of the political mechanism of the 90s, I, 90s, which are already very well covered. Second, focus on the industrialization helps to bring together various elements of both earlier transitology literature and the critical uh, ethnography of post-socialism post with memory studies of today. And third, it connects East Central Eastern Europe to more global picture of the industrialization and memory processes, at the same time provoking questions about the specificity of East Central Europe in this picture. As Stefan Berger, with colleagues, recently argued, quote, the transition from industrial to post-industrial societies took many different pathways in different previously industrial regions of the world, and the transition processes brought questions relating to how the industrial past of those regions should be remembered, end of quote. And we try to underlie with Veronica in our introduction to this conference its aim is to look at the memories of the transformation in the longer perspective than the 1989 itself, but also to see what the juncture of the East Central European transformation studies and memory studies can bring to memory studies in general. Therefore, in my talk, I will happily continue to speak <laughs> on the industrial labor force in Poland. I will also base my argument, as several other speakers did before, uh, before me, on biographical interviews. However, slightly differently than Adam Rozowicki, I will not speak on the strategies and mechanism of relating autobiographical narratives to grand history of transformation, and I will speak less about how they reflect uh, uh, about that time as still did, but I will focus on what Polish industrial staff members actually remember uh, from their personal experiences of the 1990s nowadays and how they narrate their experiences. And this I very much owe, even though I'm a sociologist by training, but I very much owe that to Lutz Nithammer, who always I had the pleasure to, to speak several times, and he always said, like, follow the episodes, <laughs> look for the episodes in the, in the narratives. And the key episode in this respect was the experience of the layoffs in the 1990s. Perhaps this, that not, this does not appear as a particularly 
original statement, but it becomes interesting when we conceive mass redundancies not only as a precondition of coping with later unemployment, but above all as a crucial mechanism to totally disorganize social worlds of post-socialism, disentangling social bonds and affecting mutual trust within industrial communities. Importantly, it affected all, those who were dismissed from work, but also those who were implementing redundancies and the rest of the staff which was after afraid of losing their jobs. Just to give you a short episode as a vignette, it comes from, the, from a boss, from a former boss of a brigade that was no, no longer necessary in the restructured company enterprise. He was told that he could stay and he could also choose two more of his colleagues to stay with him uh, out of 20 or more. He tells a story how he really tried hard that no one from his former brigade would be laid off with some, some kind of support. And he succeeded in that. Some of them got different jobs. Some of them got earlier retirement benefits. If there was a couple employed in the factory, husband and a wife, he made sure at least one of them keeps a job. He then organized a meeting with his staff at which he tried to explain the motives of his decision. It's a long episode which he concludes with bitterness. Quote, they accepted the information calmly, but when they were leaving the meeting, they didn't shake my hand, offended at me, so I explained them why I had to do it. Later, when we met in town, they pretended they were not seeing me, end of quote. Such epi episodes, I argue, bring us to more intimate vernacular experience and memories of transformation that still do not have a good public narrative of their own, but they do fuel the conflicts uh, which are taken out by the, by the grand history narratives. Um, and what I want to show today is that at the level of biographical narratives, this vernacular memory operates or is being rationalized or narrati narrativized in two modes. In a mode, there was no alternative which relates to neoliberal managerial argumentation which was internalized by some of the uh, industry employees and the moral economy narratives which brings in post-socialist nostalgia. And as the last part of my talk on nostalgia is based on my common paper written with Karolina Mikołajewska, therefore Karolina is mentioned here as the co-speaker, but for time management reasons, I will speak for both of us. So just uh, very briefly to, to, to the outline of my presentation, I will uh, touch upon that, what we've already mentioned in the uh, introduction, about the need of study the scales of the post-1989 memory global national vernacular. Then I will briefly outline this research project from which my talk today uh, stems from. I will again come back to two modes of vernacular memory, and then I will briefly talk about the patterns of post-socialist nostalgia. So, I mean, I, I don't think I have to quote your book again here, but uh, this, uh, this was the idea behind this conference also to, to look at the different scales of the memory. And as we move from the global uh, to the national, there is, as you all know, a considerable research on the national level on that what's going on with memory, especially with the very influential book by Kubik and Bernhardt on the role of mnemonic abnegators and mnemonic warriors, but also a, a, a really rich research about the stories of different narratives of the transformation, how they did evolve in, in different countries. But as I'm, I, I think, and uh, that's why we're here, the vernacular memory has not been studied enough. And why it is important? It is beca important because it somehow leads us a little bit, forces us a little bit to think beyond political boundaries and cultural wars. It reminds us of Halvax in a very different way than he is very often quoted uh, in the memory studies scholarship because like many people do refer to Halvax in memory studies but they do forget that he was uh, above all the class uh, sociologist and the workers sociologist and he first wrote his uh, major book on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the framing of the uh, of the, let's say, class, uh, working class mentality, and from that he went to the uh, collective memory. 
And then when we go to like the, the, the frameworks of rem memory from that perspective, we will remember that memories are socially framed by groups to which individuals belong by language, interaction, occupation, and work they perform. Uh, we go to this huge realm of everyday life experience and everyday life narratives, and also we have bottom-up access to values and emotions of transformation. So that project, which um, just very briefly, it has been a long, long work in progress. Uh, it's a collaborative project. I have a pleasure to, be, uh, uh, to lead it. We have uh, recorded uh, over 130 narrative biographical interviews with workers and professionals. So this is also slightly different from Adam's perspective because we were also uh, interviewing the people from the management and administration, not only the blue colors. Uh, of 12 uh, post-socialist factories that, which were sold to multinationals in the course of the 1990s. Uh, that was complemented by desk and archival research. Uh, and the goals of that project are like many oral history projects. So first of all, it's a documentation. So just we wanted to have that stories collected. Second, it's in a way intervention. So we'll have a, <laughs> we hope for that, we'll have a, a documentary all our history book published hopefully in one month <laughs> in which we uh, juxtapose different stories of the uh, transformation and thirdly so interpretation which I'm still in at trying to develop uh, the interpretative framework of, uh, uh, of the vernacular memory of transformation. So that's that we collaborate with the history meeting house in Warsaw where we, uh, uh, where we archive the interviews. So whom we have, like very lovely speaking, whom, whom we have recorded. Uh, predominantly men, but also women. <laughs> uh, the people who were, and that's really interesting, the people who were the Polish baby boomer, boomers, who are kind of a crossover generation between socialist and capitalist Poland. So majority of our respondents were, bo were born in the uh, late 40s and 1950s. That generation experience, uh, that space of experience and the horizons of expectation were shaped consequently by investments in, well, first of all, shaped by investments in economy and technology in the 1970s. And this again brings us to, uh, uh, to the book and the global and the long history of the 1989 on the global history, because that's a really important moment when the Polish economy opened for the Western licenses and they start to travel abroad and they do experience that kind of globalization. And it's very, very uh, strong uh, in these interviews, that experience. But then there comes the economic crisis of the turn of the 1980s, solidarity movement, the attempts of reforms in the 1980s, also on the factory levels, and then the experience uh, of the 1990s. And they are in the midlife careers when the worldview is challenged by the transformation of work schemes and the new work ethics which is brought by the foreign companies which brought <laughs> both the factories that were uh, so we're based. That's a list which will tell probably more to the Polish uh, uh, audience here, but these are the factories which we, which we um, conducted our, uh, our, uh, our interviews, so just kind of the lieu de memoir of the Polish industry, many of them, like Wedel, FSO, Huta Warszawa, and others, but they were sold to the multinational in the 1990s because we did wanted to concentrate on this moment of, um, of the uh, transformation. And that, why, why that, this is generally important. So what makes this region an interesting place and, and the overall map of global economic history is the particularly intense rate if compared with world trends of foreign direct investment that follow the post-1989 breakthrough. The practices and discursive discourses of catching up are among the reasons why the integration of East Central European countries with the world economy from the 1990s onwards meant the compression in time compared to the changes that had been incremental in transforming Western and Asian economies since the 1970s, as several sociologists argued in the so-called transition literature, which not always is that bad as we uh, sometimes conceive it uh, today. 
Furthermore, as Nina Van Dale argued, the essence of the post-socialist transformation, that is the simultaneity of privatization, democratization, regionalization, and globalization processes, meant enduring greater challenges than those com uh, complementing the neoliberal changes in other peripheries. Unlike some East Asian societies, which democratized only after they had connected to the global economy, East Central European political and economic liberalization were coterminal. Uh, in the course of these processes, the economy opened up to multinational, multinationals, giving them relatively easy access to new markets and a cheap but skilled labor force. Although in many cases, uh, they uh, preferred greenfield to brownfield investments, as we heard from Adam. They also became important triggers for change in former state in own enterprises. In crafting dependent capitalism in the region and in the process of privatization, those, quote, behemoths of yesteryear became modest and significantly scaled down subsidiaries, fighting for meager pro uh, profits in a hugely competitive market as Alexandra Schneider Lee put it recently. In Poland alone, even though, and this is what you can see from these figures, the multinationals did not become dominant employers, they were turned into symbols representing, on one hand, the influx of capital into the economy and subsequent innovation, and on the other hand, the sales of the country's asset by the elite. The multinationals came to exemplify both the neoliberal pursuit of an accelerating modernity and the populist narratives of the betrayal of the country, of both stable employment and a good income and laying off and pauperization. On the whole, the process of acquiring former socialist industries by multinationals was only a fragment of the general picture of transformation in the region, but it produced economic and social changes that were fast and concurrent. Uh, and that's this shift from 40s to post 40s, which in many other economies of the world took decades to come, and here in the region a few, a few years for, for many of the, uh, of the companies. So how it is remembered? So like the first, uh, first observation is that the memories are really diversified. So it's not only the narrative of the trauma. We'll find lots of other kind of narratives. It's com complementary and to and competing with official memories very often. And as I said, we can or I can observe two modes. That mode of there was no alternative, a modernization narrative versus moral. Mm, economy narrative that is often fit by the post-socialist nostalgia. So, so you will, have five minutes left. Yes, me. Okay, so very <laughs> see, I will not then speak about the moral economy and what is it, because it has been, I mean, you can define it differently, but well, in our project we refer to it as a memory discourse and not as a protest, and modernization as a memory discourse. And then just a few interviews which gives you the feeling of that. And they do come from two managers from the exactly the same company and the people who are morally on the eye level with each other. And they have a very different account of that, what happened. And these are the stories of the lace off and of the downsizing of the, uh, of the company. Later, and that's a woman who says that, later on it got better, but the 90s, that time, it was really bad. On your way to work, you met women in tears, tears and tears and tears. She is sobbing here, another is crying there. Then your family member loses a job. And you feel bad because you have a job. And what will you do? You are a member of a supervisory board, because she was one. Won't you arrange something for your sister, for your cousin? I saw true despair, those women sucked on the spot. And then there is alternative uh, explanation or the memory of the same period with a very different managerial language, uh, language said by uh, her colleague. During the first year, we offered special severance pay to those who would accept voluntary termination and agree to go. About two or three hundred went like that. Then there started an unavoidable collective layoff. They were very well prepared. We hired reputable consultants of Hay Group, and they helped us prepare a detailed plan how to downsize as painlessly as possible with much support to the layoff, and so on. Uh, 
And then, to, together with that, there comes a very generational pattern and the, and the kind of the feeling that they were a generation. So it, many of them, they said that they were lost generation because they didn't have enough skills uh, to adapt to that world, especially technical skills, digital skills, and language skills. And the others say that that was the transformation came just in time when they could adapt and, uh, uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the world. So, and then there is a whole many moral values which are uh, related to both kind of episodes and the memories of these 1990s layoffs, why they were necessary. So they could be necessary according to the modernization mode because of the future generation uh, needs, because of economic growth, and then you come the whole rationalization of that process. And then there's this moral economy mode which, uh, goes back, I still call it, to the past consensus and draws the values from there. And just to, uh, trying to conclude with the roles of nostalgia very briefly, the nostalgia comes very often with that um, moral economy uh, mode and the role of nostalgia has been recently studied extensive, extensively all over the world. So what we know, it is emotional reaction to modernization processes which helps to reconstruct identity. It builds insiders community who tells the story how it was uh, before, but it's also a critical tool in the process of organizational change today. So one of our argument is that because they do not have a narrative how to criticize what came, they very often bring the episodes from the socialist past uh, to, to bring a picture of this alternative socialist which never existed, <laughs> neither under socialist or that uh, uh, after that what happened uh, next. And there is nostalgia for so sociability of old days and very often nostalgia for one's own agency on the different levels of the uh, 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 of the, uh, among different agents and actors. And that vernacular memory, I think, uh, brings a very different and a very much more nuanced pictures of the memories of the transformation, and it kind of, perhaps not questions, but it's, it just brings a, a whole spectrum of different problems that those which are brought by the mainstream of the, let's say, memory literature about the 1980s with these fights because mnemonic abnegators or mnemonic warriors for symbols, because, well, you cannot really be an abnegator when it comes to your own biography and that what you uh, went through the past. So the people do reflect on that. And I would say they're still in search of the narrative uh, of that. But on the other hand, they obviously do somehow, their own narratives are fed by some of that uh, politics of memory, but not to that extent as we could expect. Okay, and that's, I finish with the website of our project. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Jana. Yeah. And now I would like to ask uh, Marius Jastrom. He will talk about uh, the question, how did we survive official corporate histories from the period of systemic change? Please. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> uh, what I'm going to speak about is very much uh, a work in progress, so uh, let, let, me, let me start from, uh, from a very beginning, from my uh, initial uh, ideas. Um, so uh, my, first, my first idea when I started my research was to look uh, uh, for corporate histories of Polish companies that managed to go through uh, the transformation period who remained on the market. And uh, I wanted to find a histories that I could call uh, official, which means uh, histories that were made public, first of all, but histories that were also either commissioned uh, by, by the companies themselves, financed, financed by, by, by them, or approved uh, in any other, any other way. Uh, 
So there are boards of management or other governing, uh, governing bodies. And speaking about uh, how uh, a company uh, survived uh, the transition to the, to the, to the market uh, economy. So in a sense, I wanted to focus on, on the winners um, of, of the systemic transformation on businesses that, uh, that remained uh, active, that did not bankrupt. Uh, because, well, as, as, as I thought, uh, so much attention um, has been already uh, devoted to, uh, to, to, to the losers that it would be interesting to, to look at the, uh, at the other, at the other part, uh, on the other part. And my idea was to, uh, to see, uh, to what extent, uh, those, uh, winners, let's say, uh, follow the narrative according to which uh, the 1990s are a period of selling of uh, family silver, meaning uh, selling the best Polish companies to foreign uh, investors, uh, including their competitors who, who intended simply to, to close them to, to take over their market share. Um, uncontrolled and unconditioned uh, trade liberalization, leaving industry to, to its own fate because of, of the lack of, of state industrial policy, um, states' uh, failure to, to protect employees' rights and uh, uh, to solve social problems arising from the industrialization and, uh, and, and mass unemployment. Uh, so uh, this was what I intended to do, but I encountered several problems. Uh, first of all, because my, my initial ideas were, were simplistic, uh, Stakeholders of, of surviving companies can uh, feel they, they sustain uh, significant losses and not consider themselves the winners. That's one thing. Uh, the other one was that I, I managed to, to find only a few official histories. Uh, thirdly, uh, survival means continuity, and unfortunately, there is no comprehensive framework uh, for researching uh, continuity. Uh, there is only a very uh, general definition according to which uh, a continuity of a business enterprise means uh, uninterrupted line connecting two points in time. Uh, so the definition is okay, but it does not have, uh, you know, too much practical um, significance. Um, in management science, the, the company is usually viewed as a unit that is composed of several elements. Uh, so continuity can mean uh, retaining some elements of, uh, of the company's core, but at the expense of, 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 the, of the others. Um, so uh, what... Uh, uh, what I finally uh, focused on. Um, I decided to, uh, to, to focus on what I, what I called officially sanctioned histories. That is histories that can be treated as representing the point of view of an important stakeholder group, be it present or past managers, trade union activists, uh, or members of the, of the local community. I was interested in histories that reflect 
a collective opinion, not just uh, the, the opinion of a single author, not uh, books, histories uh, published by outsiders, uh, by people who had nothing to do with a given community and, and, and a given factory. And in the, in the, in the further part of my, uh, of my presentation, uh, I will be using uh, as an example a comparison of two such uh, histories. So I will be compare uh, to uh, uh, two books about two, two factories. Uh, so I, I, I chose uh, I chose uh, histories of two. Uh, automotive uh, companies, partially because uh, of practical reasons. I did uh, research into the history of the automotive industry in Poland in the 60s and 70s. So this is something I, I am familiar with, but also because the, the narrative of uh, the industrialization and decline uh, um, poorly matches the situation of this branch of industry after, after the fall of socialism. Uh, here in Poland, but actually in the whole of East Central Europe. So uh, the automotive industry is an example of, of a branch that underwent profound changes. Uh, it started restructuring based on foreign capital. Uh, but because of, uh, of the overproduction and overcapacity in the, in the West, quite many Western investors were ready to, to come to, to this part of Europe, uh, looking simply for, for lower labor costs. Uh, as a result, uh, Poland and other countries of the, of the region attracted uh, between 1990 and, and the beginning of, and, and the first decade of the 21st century, attracted 17 billion uh, euro in foreign direct investments. Some of them were greenfield investments, but uh, some uh, went to two locations uh, where uh, vehicles, cars were produced uh, under, under socialism. So um, uh, two histories and, and, and a few words about, about two, two, two companies I'm going to, to speak about. Uh, Fabryka Samochodów Rolniczych in Poznań and Jelczańskie Zakłady Samochodowe. Uh, both uh, produced uh, utility vehicles uh, in case of Poznań uh, vans or small trucks, in the case of, uh, of Yelch, uh, buses and, and trucks. Uh, both acquired foreign licenses already in the 19, 1970s, although uh, the fiat license to produce a van in Poznań was never uh, realized. Uh, both delivered uh, uh, vehicles to, to the military, to, to, to the Polish army, and uh, uh, both were, were taken over um, after, after the fall of the socialist system. Uh, the factory in Poznań was acquired by Volkswagen, and the history of, of the Yelch factory is uh, more complicated. So, so they negotiated with Volvo and Mann, but <clears throat> they even uh, concluded a minor deal, but finally they were acquired by, by a Polish investor, uh, by Zasada Group, by a company set up by a former Polish relay driver who, uh, who, who was a representative of Mercedes in Poland at that time. Uh, then uh, the, the company was, was divided into three separate entities, two of which bankrupted, 
uh, and uh, finally uh, the third one was incorporated into into the Polish armament group but the production continued uh, in the same location even under the conditions of bankruptcy although of course on a, on a smaller uh, smaller scale so uh, uh, there are two books about these uh, uh, these two, two two companies, and uh, uh, the publication of the history of of the Poznan factory was initiated by an NGO uh, to which uh, Andrzej Bobinski, who is the, the former director of of the company from from the 70s and other former managers have, have connections. Uh, the book was published by the publishing house that is controlled by the city of Poznań and supplemented with a foreword by Jan Kulczyk, a prominent businessman who, who played an important role uh, in concluding uh, the deal with, uh, with the Germans, with Volkswagen. Uh, the book on Yelch has two editors. Uh, the first one is uh, Jan Dalgiewicz, a former director of the, of the factory, who disseminated appeals to former employees, asking them to write and send their recollections. Uh, the other one is Wojciech Połomski, who is a native of Yelch, who is a son of factory workers, who is a factory enthusiast uh, himself, and the author of, of several books on motor vehicles that were produced there. Uh, so initially it was a, a grassroots initiative, but uh, uh, they received uh, support from regional authorities and uh, uh, the book had two editions. The second one was, was supported uh, by the management of, uh, of a present day uh, Yelch. And uh, uh, the questions I was, I was uh, interested, interested in, I wanted to answer. Uh, so how, how do these uh, uh, officially sanctioned, let's say, histories uh, define continuity and, and discontinuity. Uh, what uh, uh, what what uh, what uh, the notion of continu continuity really really means? Uh, what factors do they treat as instrumental for the survival of the company? What do histories uh, tell about uh, encounters with, with otherness, meaning contacts with foreign investors, foreign, uh, foreign experts? How do they look at changes within the factory uh, during, during the transformation uh, period? Uh, both books are polyphonic, uh, and this is one of the reasons I decided to uh, to talk about about them here, which means that they are collections of, of individual memories. Um, over uh, 40 recollections in the book about Poznan, uh, nearly 70 in, in the other one. And uh, editors of both say that they were just collectors of, of individual stories. Uh, that they, they present themselves as people who just allowed other people to, to speak. Uh, it does not mean, however, that, 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 that the books are, let's say, egalitarian, uh, because people who, who tell their, their histories are mostly managers or engineers. There are very few stories from, from, from blue-collar uh, workers. Uh, and one, uh, one, of the, uh, 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 one of the most uh, uh, characteristic uh, features of uh, how uh, 
uh, how, how the history is told uh, is that uh, in these narratives, uh, human individuals are always uh, in the center. Uh, so nothing happens by accident. Everything is a result of somebody's conscious uh, decisions. And there is, there is a strict and easily traceable division. There are good guys and, 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 and bad guys. Um, so uh, speaking uh, shortly about, uh, about, about Yelch and about the, the protagonist, uh, the positive one is Dalgiewicz, one of co-editors and uh, uh, he is contrasted with his successor, with irresponsible, I mean, depicted as, as, as irresponsible uh, trade union ar uh, activists uh, who, who ousted him, and uh, uh, with, uh, with people from, from, the, from the Zastava group. Uh, so, uh, Dalgiewicz is, uh, is a father of the town because Yelch is very much a, 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 a factory town, thanks to whom Yelch received a town charter, a man respected by everybody, a kind of a local saint uh, who, who thinks about the good of the, of the company, who who was determined to, to conclude a contract with Volvo, which would, and nobody has any doubts about, about it, save uh, uh, the factory. You have about three minutes left, yeah? Uh, sorry? You have about three minutes left, so. Okay, so I will, not, I will not speak about, about, uh, about the conflicts and how they are depicted in uh, in, in the book about Poznań, but it's, 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 it's quite, uh, quite similar. Um, what I, uh, uh, what I, what, one of the things that were most, what most interesting for me uh, was that uh, the period before the, 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 system, the systemic transformation uh, in both books uh, are, uh, uh, of course, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's recollected with nostalgia, but uh, uh, both books admit that sometimes times were hard, but obstacles, constraints are always situated outside of, uh, of the factory. And perhaps the most, the most interesting feature uh, is that uh, 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 that uh, uh, these times, uh, times of the real uh, real socialism, are depicted as as times of entrepreneurship within a, a, a socialist organization. So engineer and, 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 and managers are resourceful, energetic, creative, uh, ready to accept new challenges, prone to, uh, to, to, to compete against each other. Uh, the transformation itself is, is, on the other hand, something completely external to, to the organization and, uh, and, 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 and difficult to uh, to, uh, to, to, to understand. Um, and uh, al although uh, the Poznań story is, is a success story, there is a lot of longing uh, for uh, something like genuinely Polish uh, uh, car designs or uh, genuinely Polish brands. Um, and uh, uh, well, the, the the last thing uh, I, I I I want to, to to talk about 
is the issue of, uh, of, of, of continuity and, and, and discontinuity. So in Poznan, takeover by Volkswagen represents continuity. In Lielcz, uh, takeover by Zasada represents discontinuity. And the reason for this is that uh, people from Zasada, as depicted in, uh, in, in memo memories of, of Yelch employees, break uh, certain uh, moral community. They subdue uh, companies' interests to, to their own, perceived as egoistic or, or illegitimate. Uh, they move decision-making process from uh, out, of, out of the town, and they are outsiders, and, and they, are not, uh, they are not sensitive to, uh, to, to the local uh, uh, specificity. So, uh, concluding, uh, I would say that um, stakeholders uh, evaluate subjectively what represents the continuity and what represents discontinuity of the organization. Even those who can be branded the winners uh, can embed their transformation stories in the narrative of crisis and, and decline. And what, uh, uh, what, what is, I think, uh, important in, in these uh, histories is that business historians and business history usually focuses on how uh, present managers construct a history of their organization to achieve certain, certain goals. And here we see how former employees collectively uh, 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 construct the history of their workplace uh, simply to show that what they did in the past was meaningful, that their professional life made sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. So uh, it's now, now my turn to, to give a short comment on the papers. Um, actually, I have to admit, uh, I have uh, been able to read only one of the papers in advance. So uh, it will be uh, rather, um, uh, um, well, well, I can't uh, refer to the other, uh, other papers in more detail. And actually, I have the impression that these three presentations uh, in a, uh, are very close to each other in that they refer to, to uh, similar points of, of reference. Um, um, uh, which will, um, as I'm sure, um, uh, will, will uh, be, be a good basis for a common, common discussion of all, all these three um, presentations. Actually, um, uh, I want only, only want now to point out some, some possible points of such, uh, such references or where with these papers may be related also to each other. Um, as we had two, two presentations co um, concentrating on, on, on the Polish case and one uh, on, the, on the Czech and Eastern German um, case, um, obviously what comes to, comes to one's mind is, is, is the value of, of uh, comparison of these, these cases. In, in your paper, uh, Till, you have already uh, done this for the, for the Czech and East, East German cases, and I uh, re was really um, um, staggered by, by, the, uh, by, the, by how, how important is it to, to, to remind us of the divergence of uh, transformation paths, actually, which, of course, um, uh, uh, shows uh, very well that uh, although maybe general directions may, may have been um, clear for, for all of Eastern Europe, it, it is not, not the case that there was no alternative to, to specific uh, transformation paths. And um, actually, the, the, uh, the case that, that uh, in Czech Republic, mass uh, unemployment, for example, was not so, so much and did, didn't have this socially disruptive uh, um, consequences as it had in Eastern Germany and in Poland is, of course, um, uh, a, a point which, which um, can and I think should be considered as a, as a in, in this in our debate on compar comparison work, work, workers uh, of, of workers experiences actually of um, transformation and what I found really interesting is that you um, that you described um, this this lack of shock of mass unemployment in the Czech Republic as as uh, as um, 
uh, as the basis for some kind of con continuity of a, of a classical working, working ethos, which may, might not be a, a working class ethos actually, uh, but, but which, which actually relates to, to, to long-standing uh, traditions. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, um, that brought me to the question um, why the topic of neoliberalism is not, uh, was, was quite uh, unpresent actually in all of, all of your three uh, presentations, because the last two days we were talking about lo uh, a lot of, about neoliberal capitalism and so on. Um, now we are talking about market justice, about ma moral economy, and also about um, uh, this, this, this very um, yeah, um, diverse and, and, and interwoven, uh, let's say, um, relationships between success and failure stories. And um, so, so I, I, maybe one question would be, uh, how does this very broad and maybe yeah, very, very um, abstract picture of neoliberalism coming to Eastern Europe fits into, into what, what you are, have been looking at? Another point, um, also maybe this is mainly to till, um, is uh, the question of, um, uh, as, as, you, as you said, of course, GDR and Czechoslovakia uh, were, were the two uh, most significant success stories of, of state socialism in an economic sense, and um, uh, which, which is not the case <laughs> truly uh, for Poland. Um, and. Um, uh, still, the, 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 the um, uh, transformation trajectory has been very different as, as, the, as the GDR, uh, or the East, East Germans had to experience that they had been, they had been uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the avant-garde group, uh, let's say, in the, in the socialist world, and then they, had, they, they became, let's say, uh, the periphery of, 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 uh, of uh, rich Western Germany and uh, how, how does this shock also of peripheralization uh, play out in, in, in also in, in, in relation to the, to the absence of uh, such a shock in the Czech uh, Republic? Um, uh, one, one more question which, which is maybe more, more um, relevant for all of these uh, uh, presentations is uh, again the questions uh, for temporalities of transformation and the, and the perception also of these uh, temporalities. Um, because um, as, uh, as many of you have, uh, I think all of you have, have, uh, have pointed out, um, uh, there was um, transformation initially was, um, was connected with, with certain expectations and, and also positive expectations, of course. Um, I, th I think mostly so in, in Poland because of, uh, because of the, the yeah, real deep economic crisis of the system which had existed before. Um, and so, so um, together with these uh, expectations and, and uh, arises the questions of the points of reference for these expectations. This is again uh, uh, interesting for the East, East, East German case, of course, because here we have, I think, a very clear point of reference, uh, Western Germany, but also for the, for the Poli Polish and Czech cases, where also this, this relation to the West and this trying to catching up with the West um, uh, seems to be uh, one of the real, real um, most uh, uh, important points of, of constructing one's story and constructing um, um, uh, also uh, what, what can be in the end um, or is, is seen as, as deserved actually or, or being morally <coughs> acceptable. acceptable. Um, yeah, maybe maybe this is. I have some other points, <laughs> which we maybe can uh, can uh, which which we may be able to to, to bring up later. But uh, now I would uh, um, maybe 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 I, I I put this one point because because it also was um, um, relevant for for Joanna and uh, and uh, Marius' presentation. This question of deindustrialization um, uh, and and is and is linked to to entrepreneurship uh, memories or entrepreneurship uh, narratives as you pointed out for the Polish Polish automotive industry this this uh, actually it's only a narration yeah it's, it's not it doesn't have much to do with with uh, with a reality um, but but can we can we think about a deindustrialization not uh, only in categories of, of real let's say economic economical structure but also uh, in case in, in in terms of deindustrialization of of the way people think about economy uh, that uh, what what I mean that the point of reference of of, of their economic uh, imaginary is not so much the, the factory the the state socialist 
big industry also, but, but rather this entrepreneurship, which, which is also, uh, was also shown or, or, or shown in, uh, or comes up in, 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 your, in, in your case, that this entrepreneurship is even located before 1989. So, so what's this, uh, uh, what, 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 maybe you can expand uh, on, your, on your thoughts and, and conceptualizations of this relationship between deindustrialization, perceptions of deindustrialization, and also of um, entrepreneurship. So now I would uh, like to uh, ask you maybe to, okay. in the same uh, uh, direction as we, as we had it before to, to answer uh, shortly to maybe one of the two points I brought up and then uh, I will collect questions from the audience. Okay, well, thank you for the great comments. So um, I think I'll pick up first on the, the point of neoliberalism um, and, and it's related to the comparison aspect. So, um, so I think, um, so one thing that I'm, I didn't talk about, but that is interesting in these uh, transformation contexts is that actually we have states organizing markets, right? Like in the varieties of capitalism literature. So this is state action, specifically in these central European contexts. Um, and so, and this is kind of the mixed form of, of state action. The state is downsizing itself. Um, and so, and then we have the EU as an actor coming in. And as Philip Thayer has shown, there are these different processes of actually like structural cohesion, um, regional cohesion programs. So it's not just a neoliberal story. But I do think so, in my own work, what I think is the, one of the most important mechanisms is actually the devaluation of labor which is something that, is, uh, that all of these societies are struggling with in, in one way or the other. And so that's how I sort of conceptualize neoliberalism in this. Because if you think about the devaluation of labor, then also that's, that's connected to people's experiences of this very problem. Uh, but it's also, it's of, of course, there are many more institutional ways to think about it. But I think that this is one important point when we think about like um, experiences of the transformation, like labor market experiences. Um, and then um, the, the other point, well, the temporality and the comparison, or the, the West as a point of reference, um, maybe I will just share one of, my, uh, one of the things that I came across in my material that I didn't talk about. But of course, among East German respondents, this comparison to West Germans is very important. Um, and the, so a lot of it is this sort of this idea of defiance or like that, that these Germans are in fact the better engineers or the better care workers. And so um, it is kind of shifting between trying to be equal and actually, to actually making the claim that one is actually really better at one's job because of socialist education. So I've heard that a number of times. So it's really, it's like, a, it's just a reaction to this massive devaluation of, of this identity in a sense that um, people are, are not exactly, they don't want to be treated as, uh, well, they want to be equal, but they don't want to be, they don't want to be in a dependency relationship in that sense. They want to mm -hmm. sort of be emancipated from this, from this sort of modernization trope in that sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you very much for, for the questions. I also start with neoliberalism. Actually, I'm happy, I, I didn't realize that I didn't use the word, but I was recently at the conference when you, actually the speakers were asked not to use neoliberalism and populism, but to be more inventive with that, <laughs> what we are talking about. But that's, but I think it is present in two ways. First of all, in, especially in this F, FDI, I mean foreign direct investments in, in Central Eastern Europe, this is where you have the neoliberal agenda of the 1990s. So that's what's there behind even called <laughs> differently. And uh, the second, uh, we do have a you know, deep discussion uh, with my co-author in the book we are now publishing with the interviews, how to actually call this managerial or modernization narrative we have in the, in the interviews. Because I wanted actually to have, to call it neoliberal, to, mm -hmm. to, to link to the present discussion, but they don't use such a word. I mean, neoliberalism, I mean, it's kind of our post category now, how we, how we speak about the transformation, but that was not the language, and especially it was not the word or category used by the, um, by the people on the ground. And I think it's really, I mean, if we do that kind of research, we really need to pay attention to that, what categories they were using. And this is what they experience. It's obviously an element of the broader neoliberal change, as we name it today. But it is, above all, the experience of managerial culture, of that what sociologists call the institutional isomorphism. I mean, just, uh, you know, 
becoming the same structure as many other companies over the world were. And, and, and you know, so this is what they talk about, this is what they, you know, they have problems with, what they reflect about. So mm, I would say, yes, neoliberalism as perhaps as a category which we use now to, to name that period of the time, but if we do this kind of research, we also have to be very sensitive to, to the different um, manifestation of that <laughs> so-called neoliberalism in, um, uh, in the social sector we study. Temporalities of transformation, they do obviously uh, depend on generations, so, <laughs> so it depends whom you study, for, for, those, for those which we study. Uh, the kind of the transformation really starts in 60s and 70s, because this is where they open to the, uh, you know, to the global circulation of knowledge, and they kind of stay within that global circulation of knowledge. So in the 1980s, they know the companies will not survive in such a way they, they are right now, and they do, uh, try, you know, different ways, so they are like the third wave, you know, people who do want task, that kind, but they're also those who just want to, just want to privatize, yeah, because mm -hmm. they see, they, they see that's the only, sell it, privatize, that's the only way they will uh, survive. And I, I, if I may ask just to add a question to Marius, but then you can answer later after the other people ask a question. So I was uh, actually surprised a little bit by the choice of of the sources which you have, because I think an absolutely brilliant source right now are the corporate stories of socialism. So the, these uh, companies, Western companies, which bought, you know, the socialist uh, uh, companies, but they still, because of the branding of the marketing, they do refer to the uh, to some socialist period of the companies, and there are different strategies to to, to narrativize it. So like Cad when Cadbury bought Vedel, you know, they were saying that, okay, the Cadbury family and the Vedel protestant family in Poland, that was basically the same story, and they had to meet uh, in the late 1990s because then, then they went bankrupt, yeah. and now it's a Korean film, but <laughs> they don't have a, such a nice story about them. Then there, there is the, the steel companies which tell you know the story of, of just you know a global you know ethos of the of the steel sector and how they refer to the socialist period. I would say they kind of accommodated yeah, within them. So there are plenty of I don't know if you want to include it in the future. Um, okay, so 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 your your, your study on, on on Vedel was uh, oh no, it was Carolina, I think. Uh, so so her study on Vedel was one of uh, of, of my sources of inspiration, honestly speaking. Uh, uh, but uh, what she what she writes about is is an official narrative and a <laughs> counter narrative. So this nostalgic. Uh, memory of socialism is is is, is shown as uh, uh, as a as a reaction to 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 what happens within within the company and here we've got simply uh, slightly slightly different uh, cases uh, so we've got uh, we've got Yelt uh, the company were uh, for example, the present board refers to the to the socialist past and uh, shows the period of the transformation period, uh, the nineteen uh, the second half of the nineteen nineties, let's say, uh, as as uh, as a period of discontinuation, uh, which is something they do they do uh, they do consciously. Um, and uh, uh, well, referring uh, referring to, 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 to your questions, I I, 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 I wouldn't like to to, 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 to I, I don't think I have too much to, to add to, to what has already been uh, been said. But um, when I think about uh, perceptions or temporalities, yes, they are very much uh, generational. Uh, so, uh, uh, so people who contributed to these books were also usually members of, uh, of the post-war baby boom generation. Mm -hmm. So for them, modernity started uh, already in the, in the 19, 1970s. 
uh, 1970s actually a breakthrough for, for many, of, uh, many of them. And uh, well, I was, uh, I was also wondering, but it's, it's a question rather than, uh, than, than an answer. Uh, there was, uh, there was a, a period of, uh, let's say, short-lived uh, 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 workplace democracy in Poland mm -hmm. in, the, in the early, early, early 90s. Uh, but, you know, it, it, I, I, I think it, 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 there are no traces of, uh, of, of, of this today which probably has something to do with how, uh, how uh, mostly people belonging to this post-war uh, post uh, generation thought about, uh, well, industrial relations and, and, uh, and, and relations on, uh, um, on a shop floor, let's say. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I, see, I already see three. Uh, uh, questions one here in the front, then uh, Saigun, James Mark. So now I didn't see the <laughs> who was first actually, but we take this three first. And Maybe yeah. it's, not, it's not a question. It happened yesterday that after the last session, there was another important conference in the same building on the second floor. It was a meeting of Fundacja Rzeczypospolitej, I don't know what is the official translation, probably foundation of Republican foundation or so. And there was, um, and there was presented a report about the second wave of transformation of Polish economy which is needed. The main conclusion was that about 300 companies are to be privatized. After the first wave of privatization in Poland in the 90s, w many companies were denationalized. They were nationalized again. And only the 30, maybe 50, could stay nationalized because of strategic reasons. But another, about 300, are to be privatized as soon as possible, sooner or later. Looking politically, it would be rather later than sooner, but there is no other way. And we economists would expect from our colleague sociologists to, to, to get some advice what should be done on the sociological side of the transform, new, transform, new wave of transformation. What was wrong? what should be done, and I sit for three days here and I listen to very interesting analysis, but it's rather descriptive. And we would need from somebody advice what should be avoided and what shouldn't be, because mm -hmm. otherwise, probably, the only result for sociologists would be that 35th edition of this conference would have very nice ma material to analyze. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, back there. Thank you very much for these papers. Um, I liked very much that you were thinking in kind of longer term perspective and that you're kind of locating these changes, in fact, in the 70s and the kind of changes in the global economy and 89 is there, but it's one of a number of important transformational, sh transformational shifts. But I wonder, um, g given those changes, could you say something about how your, manag <laughs> how, your, how your managers and workers relate to the idea of being part of um, broader export markets, global market, world market, and how far that's an important identity um, for them? I was also thinking about um, studies on Yugoslavia, which are quite different, but kind of show the ways in which uh, late socialist companies were functioning as part of broader global markets and then become peripheralized. And workers have a sense of themselves as actually being peripheralized through post-socialism. So there are multiple trajectories here which we might um, explore. Saigun, yeah. yes, 
Yeah, uh, I also enjoy the papers uh, a lot. Uh, I have a question uh, for Joanna and uh, actually Till. Uh, first, a clarification perhaps about the methodology. I, you know, I have this, uh, this vernacular memory concept and uh, how do you actually work with that concept uh, without assuming some kind of a, you know, organic expression of the real story or like an unmediated experience of transformations and so on and so forth. Because I assume that this is, these are based on interviews, right? Uh, so this is a kind of a work of memory too at the same time. So, so, uh, so like how do you, what do you make of that? And the other thing might be that, uh, I mean, the, the, the last part was a little bit like a fast forward and, and the, and, and, and I was uh, very, very curious about that. Uh, the question of, you know, this, this mediation of this, again, these memories, you know, this David Ost's, this defeat of solidarity argument that there's a certain idiom that is developed uh, by the, you know, this trade union activists to express, you know, disappointment, dissentments with this, in this idiom of the red barons or like stealing and the stolen factories and ownership and so on and so forth. So like the, in your uh, experience, like the, in your research, like that, do you also see that kind of a narrative in this, you know, vernacular mem uh, memory? Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and perhaps then what might be the, how is the, this inequalities among the workers actually play out? Uh, in this, you know, remembering, you know, this, this um, mnemonic, you know, practices. Uh, and uh, for the, uh, for Till, I have this, you know, uh, you, you are uh, talking about this moralization or like this moral economy uh, concept a lot. And uh, just a clarification like that, do you think that this is kind of this emerges with uh, with the 89 or this, you know, this transformations like the more and before that this was much more like an economic identity, then it becomes like the more this, this value, this becomes a more attached to a moral value? Uh, or do you think of like the shifts in the moral norms itself in the way work is or labor is actually perceived? Okay, okay maybe we we'll take one more. Uh, maybe Adam Mosowiecki and then I have seen Veronika, Jill. Sabine, and, and thank the bank. you. Uh, thank you for all three presentations. Uh, I read it a lot, uh, and uh, I have two. Uh, one, one very brief comment to uh, to to uh, Mariusz Jastrzem. Uh, uh, I'm from Wrocław, and I also did uh, research on Yelch. Uh, so uh, one of the things which is interesting, uh, and I don't know how much it is reflected in this official corporate story, is that. Uh, young workers with whom I worked at Volvo actually said that uh, a lot of people moved from Yelch uh, factory to Volvo factory and they s saw them as a part of this kind of uh, uh, quote, yes, post-communist clique, uh, which is blocking the uh, advancement of uh, workers in a Volvo factory. So, they, so, 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 you know, this kind of this kind of discourse was also present there. Uh, and and small comment also on your on your uh, I, uh, commentary on the workplace democracy. I think in the 1990s it was actually the end of workplace democracy. You know? So because you had this work councils which uh, had no choice but to agree for the privatization of the company. So 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 we were pushed to the wall so to say in terms of the uh, voice at the work. But mm, my comment to uh, is uh, related to the till uh, presentation uh, and I I really liked your work. We talked about it before, uh, and now listening to to, to it, I uh, realized that perhaps uh, um, Florian' comment to my presentation in the morning could also apply to your uh, typology in a way, because uh, then you you could you could think uh, about the dynamics between uh, the situation of uh, those workers uh, uh, in pre-89 period and the situation in the post-89 period. So you would you would have something like the continuity of disempowerment in the peripheral sectors uh, of, of of labor market, perhaps, or you know, it's not so structurally deterministic, but but in a way you have those. Uh, 
uh, people who are peasant workers, for instance, in the periphery and who actually uh, think about the, the past in terms of uh, uh, something which is quite similar to the current position uh, of, of vulnerability, precarity and so on. You would have the empowerment stories uh, mm -hmm. where, where people move from the, this, uh, from the weakness to, the, to having more influence uh, and, and success. Uh, you would have the stories, of course, of the collective disempowerment and you would have the st stories of the continuity of uh, being in a privileged place uh, and, and, and developing some kind of uh, uh, successful strategies. Uh, and here, this uh, stories of the relevance of the skills of uh, resourcefulness or everyday resourcefulness then transform into entrepreneurship and so on could, could play a role. So, so, so I'm not sure if you thought about your data in this way, but, but this would give this kind of dynamics to the story. Thank you. Oh, okay, so I propose uh, I give you a chance to answer now. Maybe we do it the other way around now. Start with Marius, uh, and then I, uh, we make a second round for okay, your questions. Okay, so f thank you for your remark on Wrocław. Yes, that's, that, this is something that is reflected in these uh, worker stories. And, and just to clarify what I meant by uh, workplace democracy, I thought about, uh, let's say, a short period uh, between the rule of the party committee and privatization, when uh, the workers' co uh, council could really elect uh, uh, or deposition uh, a director. Uh, okay, so maybe starting with James Mark question, uh, Oh, yes, so to, uh, I also know Anna Kalori's research on, on Yugoslavia, and yes, there is a lot of this being part of global market thing, but it also depends on the branch. So for cars, it's obviously important. So it's the it's the frame of reference when they, where they sell, where they go, and yeah, by whom they are being bought, and so on. Still, uh, companies important, but for food industry, not so much. So it depends. Uh, it really depends on the on the branch. Thank you for the question. From Saigon, yes, I mean, okay, I, I will not develop the, because I, I, you, everyone will kill me if I must not develop the concept. But just uh, briefly, uh, I don't think we need to look for the real story, I mean, for the past. I mean, we, we obviously we look for the con constructed past in the episode. So I'm not saying that, you know, that by listening and going to that episode, we, we know how it really was, right? We don't do that. but. It is important what episode to tell in the story, so what they still consider as relevant to uh, to tell. So I don't know if it answers you, you like quickly your question, and the rest we will continue at the um, um, at the break. And the defeat of solidarity, anger. Yeah, I, this is uh, important question. But again, I think the you know David asked. You know he very much. Uh, concentrate on the trade unions and union uh, level and at that kind of the conversation. And this is a different conversation that you are having with sitting in front of the single person narrating someone's full life, right? So, and they, they use a different, I would say, uh, uh, framing of that story than they use in the public discourse, which was the main source for, the, uh, for David Ost. And there are some, but it's not, it's that these stories are not that politicized as uh, one could have ex expect. Obviously, some are, but th th this is not the dominant way. Yeah? They, they, that someone should be blamed, made guilty, and then yes, there is that uh, uh, narrative, but it's not the, the most important. The most important, but it, it was also the focus of our research, is their own, let's say, experience of that, the episodes they do remember and not necessarily who should be blamed uh, for that today and thank you for the comment I do hope that you know my colleague sociologists <laughs> will somehow advise <laughs> the uh, economies how not to do <laughs> how not to privatize <laughs> no, or if it is really necessary then how to do it in such a way that would not uh, cause such a dissatisfaction and feeling of injustice as, as it was in the 1990s. But there are many of them who are competent in that. We are doing the history, like, you know, historical, more historical sociology research. But thank you for the comment.
Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just, um, on the question on the moralization, I just had to think of a quote by Catherine Banner, the anthropologist, which I used a couple of days ago, where she says that uh, one of the, like the moral evaluation of wealth is one of the most pervasive legacies of Soviet culture, something along those lines, in her case on Ukraine. Um, so I think that I mean, this is an enormously large question, and I'm, I'm kind of drawing on some other authors like Martha Lampland, who also wrote on the, the moral value of work in, in, for Hungarian villagers. And so, but there's, there's a lot of, I would say, evidence for that this is, this is something like a legacy in that sense, that it, it existed before 1989, and then it, it is kind of transformed, but it retained some of its element after, after 1989. Um, and I think this idea of productive work is really important. I, it, it, I came across it in my own material. Um, and that, well, I want to add another thought, although for actually making this argument, we would have to compare it to a non post socialist society. But so in this uh, social justice literature, there's always the argument that you compare yourself to, to those who, you, who are around you, basically. Like those kinds of comparisons are particularly like imaginative. And so when we think about the post-socialist scenario and the temporality of a three decades of, of comparing yourself to the trajectories of other people around you, then there's actually a lot of moral grounds for, for making these kinds of comparisons. So people just have like a very rich material to work with just because of this, this, this time frame, basically. So they don't really have to agree on like what 1989 means in that sense so much, but they, they have to agree that this is like something, the beginning of something, which is true for all of us, which is the market economy. And so I think that that, that also plays into this problem, that, that there's like this very strong urge to kind of make sense of one's own trajectory by comparing oneself. But of course, in order to make that and turn it into an empirical argument, one would have to compare it with a, with a non-post socialist society. So, um, yeah, and uh, well, thanks for the, for the comments. Um, this is very, um, I, I, I should think about developing it in this way. So what I'm, what I'm doing right now is I, I use this idea of economic agency, which basically also draws on your work, um, which um, where I'm try also trying to find out the, in the way they create the biographical narrative uh, to what extent do they apply this idea of their own agency, or do they introduce more structural factors such as luck and things like that? So I, th th that difference, I'm, I'm working along those lines in the, in the biographical part of my material, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so we have a few minutes left, and I have seen four more questions. Um, maybe we start with Veronica here, because the micro is there. Then. Ah, okay, okay, so, so I, I, I it was still also okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Sabine and uh, you in the back, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, good. Yeah, thank you for a very well-designed panel, uh, matching very well together. I would have one uh, question for Till and one for Joanna. Um, Maybe that was not in a, it was not uh, among your respondents. Uh, people from the 19, born in the 1980s were not uh, asked. Uh, no. I'm right, but still, maybe I'm allowed just to do, if you could uh, answer the question anyway, because um, it, I thought it was highly interesting and convincing. Also, uh, your um, idea of, or your how you explained how social boundaries are drawn. But I was wondering about uh, generational boundaries mm -hmm. because actually those generation or this generation born in the 1980s, they are not not any more uh, socialized um, due to this ethos of productive work. And now they, they are coming and see their own parents like struggling and um, not having this agency anymore. And uh, so, so maybe you can just shortly comment on this connection or the question, the issue of, of generations. Uh, uh, yeah, for the 1980s, and for you, Anna, you were you were very quick when you came to your very interesting um, <laughs> uh, quotations, also. And um, if I'm right, it was a woman and a, and a man, like. And obviously, I was asking myself if you find any gender patterns as yeah. well, not only generational patterns. Mm -hmm. yeah. ah, okay. So then you here. Yeah. And anyone else, last chance, yes, last call. Okay, so this will be the last question. Please keep it short and then 
short answer, answer okay. for you. My Václav Nieuważny from Politechnika Warszawska. I have a remark uh, about the terminology and the formal, uh, formal remark. The, I, am, uh, in, I'm from, I am curious to know whether we could improve our terminology on discussing from the Western point of view, many participants are from Western Germany and Western Europe, uh, let's say in this discourse, and we have a different situation of Czech Republic being industrialized before the First World War, this similar uh, earlier than Poland. East Germany was nevertheless industrialized as part of Germany, whereas Poland was industrialized later on. So my point is that this round table uh, agreement stipulated something which would be worth to recall, that solidarity would take part only in ruling our country after one term of same, which never happened it, for various reasons. So this, uh, I finish with a remark about the new edition of uh, Friedrich Bernstein, Was is Socialismus, which was edited only in 1999, by uh, this uh, uh, Krakow Wojewodship uh, leader and uh, edition by Jola Kwaśniewska Foundation. And there was a quote in it, so to distinguish between socialism, real socialism, and capitalism, and liberalism, that the, we, the socialist in, social democrats in Germany in 1899, will preserve all institution of capitalism market, uh, division of labor, division of uh, power, and uh, all institution banks, and so on. So this was termed to be revisionist, and the very fact that this book could not be edited during 100 years, again, it was a reprint of a translation into Polish of 1899. And you, I take care about, I would uh, attract your attention to the fact that Polish, former Polish People's Worker Party officials like Kwaśniewski, Oleksy, and Miller all uh, joined the socialist, the socialist International, not anymore. So this is distinct from the Leninists and Bolsheviks present in Poland and Czech Republic and East Germany makes a room that European Union is a lot of socialist parties uh, ruling this uh, so social cohesion problems. So the social market economy term in our constitution is a, a testament, testament to the fact that those who wanted to have a smooth transition from former uh, Bolshevik-like uh, Leninist uh, rule, ideology ruled economy uh, to uh, smoothly transform into a market economy without being uh, overly uh, indebted to, a, to a, uh, an ideology of liberalism. But the role okay. of capital and uh, understanding of contemporary capitalism was missing in our case in many respects as we witness from all those stories. I think this understanding of capitalism was better in the cadres of Polish People's Workers' Party whoever have contacts with the West and were uh, integrated into world market already 20 years before transformation. Okay. So of, this of is the point. The role of, of post-communism so post is actually important. So I think so the my point, point has is been that there is, so a, there is a room for improving terminology. This is my okay. Okay. Yeah, thank remark. You. Thank you so much. So you have your, the last chance to answer the questions posed and also through the comments. All right, yeah, I'll just answer to the generational boundaries question. Yeah, thanks for that. So I, since I was, um, I, I guess my focus was slightly different because I also had a focus on friendship relations in my, so I'm, they, but then when they appeared, they appeared also in this, in the realm of skills again, where there's this younger, younger generation, which uh, some people create a boundary to, you know, younger care workers who, who don't share the same work ethic and they're, all, they're only all about the money, or they're only, like, they don't, they don't know how to connect socially anymore. And then among engineers, there's this trope of that the young engineers are superficial, like the West Germans, basically. So and that I heard more than once, actually, like this idea that you don't, they don't know how to draw by hand, they, they, so they, because they've been, they've been computerized much earlier, and so they use these computers, and so they forgot how to do their work substantially, basically, so, yeah. G gender question. Well, obviously there are gender patterns, but most of them which are there are already so well described <laughs> that it simply does not add much. So that's, yes, that was, I mean, that example, yes, that was a female manager and a male manager. And the big difference between them is that she, she was a widower with 
four children at the, uh, at the moment of transformation, two of her former husband and two of her own, and she simply needed that she needs to survive in the, uh, in the company to provide for the family, and that might also bring more sensitivity of her to the situation of other women who are being kicked off or like uh, dismissed from the, uh, from the factory at that time, so on the personal level. So, yeah, so, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, so then you have this gender-related uh, problems of uh, mass redundancy, but uh, I think quite well described in the literature. What is interesting part, that we do have several women who actually really benefited from the transformation, and they talk about that openly. They say that their career would not be possible uh, under this, you know, in this male world of the socialist industry, and this were the foreign companies which actually made their career possible. And they are, you know, kind of, the, one of them is actually a top manager for the Eastern Central Europe. So these are, I would say, some counter stories uh, um, of the uh, of the gender trauma of the like the women's trauma of the 1990s, but a few examples against you know the huge and the massive experience of the uh, impoverishment of the um, of women in the 1990s. Okay, Marius, uh, anything you want to add? Last yeah, occasion. Okay. Well, I, I think we have. We, I think you have one minute for if, if there's well, just, anything you want so, to add. So just, uh, just, <laughs> just a sentence about generations. So uh, I, I think. Uh, well, the story about. I mean, how how the younger generation was socialized is perhaps a subject for another long discussion. But uh, stories about young people who have never seen their parents going to work are an important part of these narratives about, uh, about the systemic change as well. Okay, Th thank you very much. Thank you all so much for this uh, uh, great conversation we had, I think, uh, and uh, the fruitful discussion. Uh, and I guess, so, so thank you.